this presentation is on power analysis uh, using G-Power software. Uh, it's an applied guide, meaning that um, there will be uh, examples shown using G-Power, and um, the uh, examples are going to range uh, in terms of the, the most frequently used types of tests. Uh, but I want to start out with um, a little bit of background, um, just so that uh, the, the sort of overall theory of, of why we even do power analysis is uh, covered, and then we'll get into the specific examples. So uh, generally speaking, there are uh, two things that we need to consider. One is um, what the actual state of the world is. Okay? This is what we're trying to find out by conducting a study in the first place. Right? So our study could find that there is an effect present or that the effect is actually absent. And that finding could or could not reflect the state of the world. So if we find that the effect is present, and indeed it is present, then we do what's called rejecting the null hypothesis. Um, and we say, OK, we, we've rejected the notion that there is no effect, and therefore we can conclude that there is an effect, and that's what this cell represents. On the other hand, we could conclude based on our study that there is no effect, that it's absent. And in fact, if the state of the world is that it is absent, then we retain the null hypothesis. Sometimes we refer to this as failure to reject the null hypothesis. It means the same exact thing. But sometimes these uh, results don't actually pan out as, as clearly as that. So sometimes we conclude that the effect is absent. And in fact, out in the world, whether we know it or not, the effect is real. And that's what we call a type 2 error. It's also called a miss. Uh, because we missed the effect. Um, and this is kind of where power analysis is the most uh, pertinent for social science studies, um, because we want to make sure that we collect enough data to not miss an effect that is actually real. Um, the other type of error, uh, the type 1 error, is where we conclude that the effect is present, but in fact it is absent. And due to some kind of design or sampling error, we've gotten a false alarm. Um, and typically, uh, this is an issue that um, is not as big of a concern with power analysis. It is a concern in terms of uh, not wanting to oversample, and we'll get to that. But um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is uh, regarding type 2 error. Um, and now our uh, desired outcomes is that we have a probability of a type 1 error that's less than 5%. And this is what you see in a lot of journal articles, a lot of book chapters, a lot of empirical studies in general, uh, where you're hunting for that infamous p is less than 0.05 value, that p is less than or equal to 0.05. That's the standard by which we say, OK, if uh, the, the effect is absent, what is the probability of seeing this effect? And if it's really small, then we conclude, OK, it's not, it's not a, a absent, it's actually present. So that's what that p value is all about. Um, but then we have the, uh, the probability of a type 2 error is also something we have to consider. And we want that to be less than 20%. So we want to uh, miss real effects less than 20% of the time in social science. So uh, that um, is what is represented by this value of 0.8. Uh, when we get to G power, you'll see that um, it typically starts you out with a power level by default of 0.95. Uh, and that's a more strict uh, uh, power level. But in social science, um, it's generally agreed upon that 0.8 is uh, the minimum that you want. And you use that as a basis for determining what sample size you're going to need. OK. Um, so next up, the, the, the next important piece is you know, we're talking about p-values. We're talking about uh, what's called alpha. It's a, it's a synonym for p-value. Um, and that is an important piece. We want to know whether an effect is statistically significant out in the population that we're, that we're studying. Um, but it only tells you whether an effect is statistically significant. The magnitude of an effect is also important. So uh, when I say magnitude, I mean effect size. And uh, what that kind of means is that if you have uh, a ton of data, a 1% improvement in one group compared to another, may be statistically significant. 
And conversely, with not enough data, a 50% improvement, some, some huge change or, or difference may turn out to be non-significant, so that the p-value is greater than 0.05. Well, okay, great, but that is still informative, right? If you have a study that didn't collect enough data to detect statistical significance, but you found a relatively large effect, that's still telling you that there is a meaningful trend there. So um, when you look at previous literature, when you look at things that are clinically significant, uh, you really want to pay attention to the effect sizes that are being reported in addition to p-values. Because sometimes you see these studies and um, they say, oh, p was equal to 0 0.051, and therefore this is you know, not an important effect, and, and they move on and the discussion doesn't even mention it. And then they have another effect where the p is 0 0.049, and they're saying, oh, this is the most important thing ever. Well, uh, that isn't really uh, a, a, a completely full picture that's being painted of the results. So um, you have to keep in mind that uh, the p-value is just one part of the puzzle. And um, I'll show you the, the rest of the picture from a quantitative perspective um, over the next few slides here. So. Um, also, there are many measures of effect size, and, and we'll look at that as well. So um, before we get to that, um, we have to know the consequences of, of conducting an underpowered study. So like I said, the, the type 2 error um, is what this is all about. And here, if you conduct a study that doesn't have enough participants, you don't know whether the effect is not real or whether the effect is real or you just committed a type 2 error, that you missed the effect by virtue of not having collected enough data. And uh, that's only one consequence. The other consequences are that if you conduct a study, participants are put at risk uh, without hope of valid conclusions or benefit to society. So you conduct a study, um, you don't know whether there's nothing going on or whether you just missed something that is going on. And at the same time, the data that you collected exposed participants to potential risk especially if you're studying things like depression, uh, PTSD, um, something that could potentially uh, trigger someone into having, um, you know, uh, uh, an episode of, uh, let's say, a, a panic attack or uh, are triggered somehow into relapse of substance abuse, who knows. Those are real-life consequences for real-life individuals. So um, if you conduct a study that doesn't have hope of validly detecting an effect, what's the point of exposing people to risk? Um, and the other uh, uh, consequence is that if you look at um, the flip side of this, is that you, know, you, you, for example, run a study of an experimental treatment um, and you don't collect enough data to see whether it is actually effective, you, know, you could see maybe a decent effect size, but if that p-value is not close to significance, um, you're treading water and you're not going to be uh, able to uh, share that result with the world because people really crave those statistically significantly better treatments. Um, so if you collect enough data, you expose participants to risk, but at least you would know that it is an effective treatment. And if you conduct a study that is underpowered, you simply would not be able to know. Um, okay. so. Uh, there is a flip side to this, which is oversampling. So I just covered the consequences of having not enough data. Um, there are also consequences to having too much data. Um, so the more data you collect, the more precise is your estimate of the actual effect out in the real world, and the more power you have to detect uh, the effect. So uh, that p-value might be less than 0 0.00001, right? The, the, the chance that it's not a real effect is tiny. And, and we can see this. I'll show you an example of, of how this works. But um, the flip side of this is that clinical significance may be non-existent. You can have a tiny, minuscule effect uh, that lacks any kind of clinical significance. But it could be statistically significant. Um, and it also exposes too many participants to potential danger. So just like with an underpowered study, you're exposing people to potential harm. With collecting more and more and more data, you're still exposing people to potential harm, right? So that's the same. Um, and for what benefit, right? You could get uh, a tiny effect that 
is, is not very helpful, but at the same time is statistically significant. Excuse me. So um, let's illustrate this. This is, uh, these graphs are uh, showing an experiment that uh, was conducted by Facebook. They sampled over 600,000 uh, of their users. And what they did uh, is that they um, reduced the amount of negative content that people saw in their feeds. And then they looked at whether or not uh, the, the amount of positive words in people's own posts uh, changed and if the number of negative words in their posts change. So if you reduce the amount of negative information that they see, okay, uh, what happens to their own affect? And you can see that if you reduce negativity, you, you, uh, you have the experimental group. These are the folks who actually had this um, manipulation done, and this darker blue bar represents the folks who had no manipulation. So on average, they have about you know 5.2 some odd percent positive words, and then if you reduce negativity, then they have like about 5.2 something else uh, uh, positive words. And similarly, if you look at negative words, uh, about 1.75 percent uh, are there uh, in the control group, and then if you reduce negativity in somebody's feed, that drops down to 1.7 percent. Okay. So these are really, really small effects, but they are statistically significant. In fact, um, this change in terms of uh, positive words represents a 0.06% change. So 6% of 1%. Now, is that really a meaningful difference? I would argue no. But it is a highly significant effect, and uh, at the same time, D is a measure of effect size. This is the number of standard deviations apart that these two groups are and it's 0 .008. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny effect. Um, and the same thing holds for uh, the, the decrease in negative words. It's 0 .007 percent, all right? So just as small of an effect as uh, uh, this um, positive word effect. Again, highly significant, tiny effect size. So, uh, you know, the clinical significance of this finding is not all that important. Um, and yet 600,000 people were exposed to what could be uh, considered un an unethical treatment. And you might be asking yourself, well, why is that? The reason is that they also conducted a second study where they reduced positive content. All right? And so here, uh, you know, when you reduce negativity, it's like, okay, well, you're making Facebook more cheerful, more positive. Um, and, and that might be a good thing, right? Because it reduces negativity a tiny bit and it increases positivity a tiny bit. Great. Well, if you reduce positivity, you see the opposite trend, right? In the control group, same kind of thing as the other control group, it, about 5.25% uh, positive words. But then if you reduce the amount of positive content that people see, um, the number of positive words that they post decreases and the number of negative words they post increases. And you see that these negative graphs are upside down. I don't know why they chose to present these figures this way, but anyway. Um, the, the, the fact that this light blue bar is lower actually represents an increase in uh, negative words. So again, these are small effects, but they're highly significant. The, the point of this is that you exposed 600,000 people to this uh, experiment. And so 300,000 of them are exposed to the experimental conditions, right? It's half and half. And the, uh, the problem there is that if even one person has some kind of adverse reaction, maybe they, you know, do something uh, harmful to themselves or to others, become depressed, whatever the case may be, uh, that's an adverse consequence to learn something that is in all honesty, not all that clinically significant. If you're talking about basic scientific findings, great. You found that there's this sort of contagious effect of if you see more negativity, you're going to be more negative by a tiny amount. If you reduce positivity, you're going to be a little bit more negative, so on and so forth. But if we're talking about clinical psychology, this kind of tiny uh, impact that uh, a treatment has is not worth the potential risk. So there is a problem with oversampling, just as there is a problem with 
uh, undersampling. So what we have to do is find the minimum number of participants that are required to detect an effect of a certain size and to detect an effect that has some clinical significance. So we'll talk a little bit more uh, about the, um, uh, the clinical significance piece. But for now, what we need to know is, uh, you know, again, that minimum sample size, which is determined by three inputs, which is your chosen alpha of the p-value, the chosen power, that's that, uh, you know, 0.8 value that I showed you, which is the, um, the odds of detecting an effect if it's real. And then the effect, expected effect size. So this piece is what I was just kind of talking about, where um, you want to know uh, what would count as a clinically significant effect, and that's something that um, would come out of the literature where you kind of understand, okay, well, if a treatment is deemed more beneficial than another treatment, then you would expect people to have this kind of score versus this kind of score, and then you can calculate the effect size. Or you can look at things like T-scores, um, where if you are above, say, a score of 65, um, then uh, you would consider that to be a clinically significant uh, score, so on and so forth. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. The, the main idea is that once you have all those pieces in place, then you can prevent both type 2 and type 1 errors. So, okay, this begs the question, what kind of effect are you supposed to even expect? And like I just alluded to, um, you would use your domain expertise uh, to determine what would constitute a clinically significant effect. And then uh, the other piece is that your study design that you ultimately settle on is going to dictate uh, the effect size that you should expect. And there's a really, really, really important article uh, written by Cohen in 1992. It's called The Power Primer in the Journal Psychological Bulletin. Um, we have it available here at the Chicago School via the EBSCO database. Um, so if you go to the library website, you can track this down. I highly recommend reading it. Um, it's very straightforward. Well, very. That's a relative term for me. Um, but it is a good, like it says, primer about why uh, um, this is an important aspect of uh, planning your research and also giving general guidelines about what sample size will be required depending on what design you are using. So if your design um, has two groups and you want to compare them on um, uh, their rates of depression, let's say, where one group got um, an, uh, a certain type of therapy and another group got some placebo uh, intervention, then um, you know, you'd want to find the concomitant um, uh, effect size to go with that. Or if you're looking for a correlation between um, two different variables, that would dictate a different uh, approach, so on and so forth. And we'll, we'll look at uh, some examples of this as we uh, go through. So um, one other way to look at uh, expected effect sizes is to look at previous literature. So this, this, this slide here that I just covered talks about you know, clinical significance. Right? Uh, this one here uh, is a more sort of empirically based piece where you would look at previous literature that studies, that has studied similar effects and then note the effect sizes that they observed and then you would basically assume that the state of the world for those studies is the same state of the world that's going to apply to your study. And so you can basically uh, use those previous studies as a basis for what effect size you're going to see in your uh, data. And so there's a bunch of these. Depending on the study design, you could see them reporting Cohen's D or Hedges G, uh, eta, which looks like this kind of lowercase n uh, squared. Sometimes it's partial eta squared, which is what this, uh, whoops, which is what this um, lowercase p stands for is partial. Uh, sometimes you see omega or omega squared, and Pearson's R. Pearson's R, this is just a correlation coefficient, which, believe it or not, is a measure of effect size. Um, that's a correlation coefficient, which uh, we all know and love. And then sometimes they don't report effect sizes. You'll see this in older studies. Um, over the last... 10, 20 years, effect sizes have really become uh, more and more widely accepted, not just in statistical circles, but also just in the general research community. So if you find yourself reading a study that only reports like means and standard deviations, you can always calculate an effect size. Um, 
And uh, from there, it's important to note that the statistical tests that are used in previous lit do not have to be identical to those that uh, you would be using um, based on your study design. You can always transform effect sizes among these. Um, and if you have a question about that, uh, when the time comes, let me know. You'll have my contact info at the end of the presentation. But uh, there are different equations that you can use to um, uh, transform each one of these effect sizes into one of the others. So um, depending on what design you're using and what design the previous study used, you can always um, extract a meaningful uh, comparison that you can then plug into G-Power and uh, know for your given design, given the population effects that you can expect, what sample size you can need. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of different effect sizes out there. And this list is taken from Cohen, 1992. It's that um, article that I showed you the citation for on the previous slide. Um, what's important to note here is the type of test, we've got all kinds here. Um, the, the test for independent means, this is a t-test where you're comparing the means of two different groups. Um, there's uh, the correlation, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the correlation coefficient is number two. There's all different kinds here. You've got an ANOVA um, and then regression. What I want to draw your attention to is the conventions for effect size in these columns. So a small effect uh, takes on different values depending on the kind of test that you're conducting. So like I said, uh, if, one, if, if a previous study found a small effect, right, and okay, that's interesting, but for your study, you have to run a correlation. Okay, well, <clears throat> you wouldn't use the same effect size uh, from a study comparing two groups to a study that is uh, going to be running a correlation, right? You see that these uh, small effect sizes use different values. And the, the math I'm not going to dwell on. Uh, suffice it to say that the same effect size has different values. You see that, for example, in uh, regression, a small effect has an F squared value of 0.02 versus in a t-test, it's 0.2, which is 10 times larger. So um, certainly it's important to uh, um, use a table like this to, uh, to come to a more meaningful uh, value that you can then uh, transfer into your study. So if, for example, you see a study that had a small effect and they used the t-test and they said, okay, well, the Cohen's d is 0.2, and then you're now expecting a small effect, but in your study you know you have to run a correlation, then you wouldn't say 0.2, you would say 0.1, right? And you would plug that into g-power. Um, okay, so uh, with that, um, I want to talk about the actual way that you would do this in G-Power, right? So uh, there are a number of common test examples that I want to go through, um, starting with um, our old friend, the independent samples t-test, moving up into a one-way ANOVA, which is a t-test, well, it's not a t-test. A t-test is an ANOVA with two groups. Um, an ANOVA can have from three to however many groups. Um, so essentially, one example of an independent sample t-test would be, again, something I already alluded to, which is a treatment group versus a placebo group. You could run a study where you randomly assign people into this treatment or into this placebo and then see how they do on some measure of, let's just say, uh, depression. So um, in G-Power, uh, if, you, if you follow along, you can kind of point and click as I go through it. Uh, if you didn't download it, no big deal, um, because this uh, presentation, again, will be on YouTube. So uh, this little button here called Tests is really the heart of uh, where you can focus your energy in terms of um, getting the kind of test that you want. And there's five of these different options. You see correlation and regression. We're going to go to means. And there's a ton of different tests here, right? And you see they're broken up into three different groups, or sorry, four different groups. Uh, the first group has to do with uh, t-tests. So um, you see that there's uh, two independent groups here. That's the independent samples t-test, as the name suggests. And when you click on that, um, 
there's a couple of other pieces of information that are going to become important. The first is this type of power analysis. You always want to run a priori. There's also post hoc, and this is a questionable technique. I'll get to this later, but for now, uh, a priori all day. A priori means before, um, meaning before you run your study. And so uh, what you're then going to do is make some inputs here. You see you've got your effect size, you've got your alpha error probability, this is the p-value that you're trying to achieve, and then you've got your power. Like I said, G power sets it at 0.95 by default because in different branches of science you have different uh, power levels that you're trying to reach. Um, in psychology and social science in general, 0.8 is the sort of agreed upon value, just like 0.05 is the agreed upon p-value. Um, in some branches of science, you need a p-value of 0.001. Otherwise, um, people in that field agree that there could still be the risk that the effect uh, doesn't exist. But in any case, um, this, is, this is really the, the, uh, the central piece here, is the effect size that you're expecting to find. Because depending on what, ex bleh, what effect size you're expecting, say that three times fast, um, you will need more or fewer participants. So uh, what's nice about G-Power is that it, it, for some tests, if you hover over the effect size uh, window, it gives you the conventions for small, medium, and large effects. And these are based on Cohen. So that table that I showed you uh, earlier, it has the same values as uh, what G-Power pops up. So OK, if we assume a medium effect size, uh, for a independent samples t-test. Uh, we can hit calculate and then down here are your output parameters where it tells you the sample size for group 1 is going to be 51 and for group 2 it's 51 for a total sample size of 102. And that would be the sample size that you would need to detect an effect of this size. Now, it's not always uh, easy to say, well, okay, I'll just do 0.5. Again, you have to know what would constitute clinical significance in your field, and you would have, well, not and, it's like and or. Uh, you would want to know what previous studies have uh, found. Um, if, it's, if there's not a lot known about this field that you're studying, it's always better to revert back to uh, what would really constitute a clinically significant effect. Um, and so uh, when you're looking at this effect size, it's not always going to be a medium effect, right? 0.5 is a medium effect size. What is typically the case is that you see small to medium effects. If you see a large effect, um, I'm sorry, if you're expecting a large effect, then that's great because you need many, many fewer participants. Uh, one great feature of G-Power is that it quantifies uh, what the different effect sizes would yield in terms of required um, sample size. And that's what this button down here is. When you say, uh, okay, G-Power, give me a plot for a range of values, uh, this window pops up. Oh. And what this window does is uh, once you tell it what you want to see, it will plot for you um, a range of sample sizes. So what we want to know on the y-axis is the total required sample size. And on the x-axis, we want to know uh, well, at this point anyway, the, um, the, the effect size that goes from a small value up to a medium value. And I'm just going to simplify this and just say point of, in steps of 0.05, and you'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to display the values in the plot, and I'm going to say zero digits. Actually, no, I'll just show you what happens when you have three digits by default. When you draw this plot, it tells you, okay, depending on the effect size that you're expecting, again, small effect size on the left, um, and lar well, medium effect on the right, uh, what sample size you would need. And you see that as the effect size gets larger, you need fewer and fewer participants, right? So if it's a medium effect size, you need 100.302. This is why I drop it to zero significant digits, because you're not going to get 0 0.302 participants. It's impossible. Um, however, if you do get a, a fraction, it's always better to round up, because that 0.3 should round up to the next person, but anyway. Um, so you see that as it gets smaller, it exponentially increases the required sample size. So um, it is very, very important to know 
what effect size you're expecting. Because if you're running a study and you undersample, you look at what the consequences of that could be. Why would you expose 100 people to a potentially uh, adverse consequence if you know that you're expecting an effect size of 0.15? You just expose 100 people to, uh, or maybe 50 people, you know, half of it is the group that would be exposed to some experimental treatment. Um, but still, 50 people being exposed to uh, a dangerous intervention is not uh, expected to yield a significant effect. So um, there's no sense in conducting that study. If you know that you're expecting a small effect and you see that you would need 2,400 participants, you might want to go back to the drawing board, especially as a student. Um, if you have a million dollar grant from NIH and you have the ability to conduct that kind of study, great. Um, but for a dissertation or for, uh, you know, a project where you're going to be limited by your real world logistics, um, it helps to know what you're going to be getting yourself into. So uh, this is a very important um, piece. Now, obviously, uh, if you already know what, ex what effect size you're expecting, then you can just plug in this number directly and it tells you right here what's going on. Um, also, remember I mentioned about uh, rounding, right? So you see that here, um, it just rounds it to 100 because 0 0.302 rounds down to 100. But here, G Power is smart enough to know that it has to round up. And so uh, you see that it would be 102, not 100. Okay, so that is the independent samples t-test. I want to pause here. Let's see if there are questions. You can type them in, or uh, if you've muted yourself, feel free to unmute um, and fire away. I'm going to move on. If you're still typing, keep typing. Um, I'm going to move uh, on to the Hi. Uh, and hello. this is, again, to a t-test, that instead of two groups, you can have more than two. And again, a t-test is an ANOVA with two groups, so they're, they're closely related. Um, but here, you see it's two independent groups, right? Here, we're doing many groups, and many just means more than two. Um, so, okay, again, just as with uh, the t-test, it asks you for the effect size you're expecting, the uh, alpha level, the beta level, again, change that to 0.8, and the number of groups that you have in your design. So if, uh, if you have five groups, that's the default, whatever. I mean, it could be three groups, depending on whatever your study design is. You know, here in the example that I'm showing, it's a treatment condition versus a placebo condition versus a no intervention condition. Okay, so we've got those three, and... Um, we want to see if there's a significant effect in there. Now, again, it conveniently pops up these uh, effect size conventions. So again, if it's a medium effect size, just hit calculate down here, and it tells you, okay, you need 159 participants. Um, just as with the t-test, it doesn't tell you this, that you need um, 53 per group, but that's what this translates to, is that you would need 53 per group, because 159 divided by three groups is 53. Um, so don't think that you need three groups of 159 each. Um, okay, uh, I see there's a question that just came through. Uh, would you please perform one with regression when you don't know your effect size? We will get to regression. Uh, this is the first of three um, slides looking at uh, the different tests that we'll examine. So yes, uh, we will get there. And uh, if I haven't answered your question, then um, let's, uh, let's chat about that. Okay, but for now, um, again, it's the same thing. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? This is actually a good reminder because if you don't know the, uh, the effect size, you can calculate it. That's, uh, so I'm going back to the t-test here, right? Difference between two independent means. Um, if you don't know the effect size, but you do know, for example, the, the means from the two different groups that you're expecting, um, then you can calculate the effect size very easily. You can do it by hand, but I mean, G-Power does it for you. So um, let's just say that, you know, you're saying that uh, the effect in one group, in the control group, is expected to be 50, and in the other experimental group, you're expecting it to be 65, let's say. I'm using T-scores here just for the sake of argument. Um, and the standard deviation in one group, in the, the group one, I'm expecting to be 10, and in the other group, I'm expecting it to be, oh, I don't know, let's just say 7. I can calculate the effect size there. 
<laughs> yeah, that is a massive effect size. And then you can also click calculate and transfer domain window. Watch what happens here, okay? Uh, calculate and transfer domain window. It takes this value from here that is just calculated and plops it into here. And then you calculate your, uh, your required sample size for a total of five per group. That would be really nice. And you know why? Because 50 uh, with a standard deviation of 10 is nowhere near 65 with a standard deviation of 7. Those distributions are so far apart, you would basically instantly see that effect with as few as five people per group. Now, obviously, if I make this 50 and 51, now I've got a much smaller effect. Whoops. I've got a much smaller effect size. And if I run this, then you see that I need 922 per group. Right? So um, that is part of G Power's magic. That's what this determine button does. Again, it opens this kind of window. Um, or they call it a drawer. Um, now, the other thing that we were doing is the ANOVA. So let's find that. And still in means, but now we're under many groups. No, and you see there are many different types of these tests. I'm just going through the sort of most uh, common example. Um, so, okay, uh, we're looking at this medium effect, 0 0.05, 0 0.8 with three groups. Um, again, we can determine this from mean or from variance. Uh, so if you're looking at, uh, at it from the sort of clinical significance perspective, it's better, I would argue, to um, use means uh, because you know the instruments you're going to be using. And uh, you know sometimes what values are associated with things like depression. So you, you, you often have T-scores that tell you, okay, any score above 65 is, or is counting as clinically significant. Anything below that is not. So if you want to do it that way, um, then you can uh, certainly type that in. Um, and if you have uh, these kinds of values in mind, then certainly um, it is, you know, useful to put them in. Now, for this one, I'm just going to split the difference and say, uh, what, 57.5. Um, and you also have to input the standard deviation within each group. It only gives you one. Like, why is there means for each group but not a standard deviation for each group? It's because ANOVA assumes uh, what's called homogeneity of variance, which then means that you have... Um, uh, Oh, you know what? I'm not hearing any static from the, uh, oh, right. I'm sorry if I missed any questions, actually. I thought my sound was coming through my speakers, but it is certainly not. Um, but yeah, if we're getting static, uh, I'm just going to uh, mute you and, oh, looks like you just did it. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, Okay, so, right, um, the, the assumption is that the standard deviations are going to be the same within each group. So we have to uh, tell it, okay, well, let's just say it's five within each group. Um, and then what we also have to say is the sample size. And this is kind of a chicken and the egg problem because you don't know what sample size you need until you know uh, what effect size you're expecting, but it won't tell you the effect size uh, until you tell it the sample size. So here, um, you could do a little trial and error, or um, you could not do it this way, but remember that we had this option of this range of values, right? So if we do it that way, uh, then, again, I'm going to say as a function of effect size here and the total sample size from 0.1 to 0.5, again, let's just do it in steps of 0.05. We'll display the values with zero significant figures, and we'll draw the plot. So now you see that the, the top end value is 42. So if you're expecting a, a pretty decent sized effect, you would need 42 uh, participants. And if you're expecting a tiny effect, 966. So each one of those has to be divided by three, obviously. Um, but it, it gives you a sense of um, what value to put in there. So if you know that you're going to be expecting a smaller effect, you can take this value, 966, divided by three. Uh, I'm not going to try to do that math in my head. Um, 
So, okay, so you'd be expecting 322 participants per group. Okay, so you can go back to this window here and um, and then say, all right, well, then in that case, I'm going to put 322 and transfer that into the main window. We see that's our effect size. And this is going to be, I mean, a, a tiny sample, yeah, um, a total of 12. Because what I'm telling it is that we have pretty big mean differences and relatively small standard deviations, but we have a giant sample, right? So um, the effect size here um, is large, and so you need a small sample. But now if you go back in and say, all right, well, if I know that my sample is four per group, and I type that in, you see that I have this, it's the same effect size, right? So if I calculate that, and then, okay, obviously it tells me that that is uh, the same. Okay, so um, in any case, uh, let's see, are there any other questions at this point? Okay, right, we'll get to that regression. Okay, we're good. Okay, what else was there? Uh, the MANOVA. Okay, so a lot of times what uh, researchers do is they'll have um, a scale that they administer to multiple groups, um, and it has subscales. So uh, it may be of interest to analyze all of those subscales, in which case you're not just analyzing one dependent variable, but three, four, five, however many. And uh, in that case, again, you're going to tests and means, again, same, same idea. But now uh, what we want is down here, multivariate, MANOVA global effects. And so here, uh, just as with ANOVA, we had those F values of 0 0.1, 0 0.25, and 0 0.5. Uh, with MANOVA, our effect sizes are F squared. So you would take, if you're expecting a small effect, it's 0 0.1 squared. So 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 is 0 0.01. Um, 0 0.25 times 0 0.25 is 0.125. And uh, 0.4 times 0.4 is 0.16. So basically, all you have to do is take F and square it. Right, so literally, uh, if you're using a calculator, you can take 0.1 and square it, so you get 0.01, and then that's what you would put in. Um, and the same, the same thing holds in terms of uh, the power, and um, you see that the number of groups, again, if you have three groups, like in the example I'm giving here with the treatment, the placebo, and the no intervention, you have three groups, you may have four, you may have two. Um, and then depending on the number of response variables that you have, that's where uh, um, it gets interesting. However many subscales you have or how many different uh, variables you want to analyze, um, that's what you would put. So let's say your subscale, you have four subscales. Well, then you need 756 participants. And again, divided by three, right? Each group gets 756 divided by three, which in this case is, uh, what is that? 252 per group. Okay. Now, this, of course, is a small effect. If I went with the 0.125 example, this is a medium effect, then you see it drops down precipitously. And again, you could graph the, uh, the range of values. So here it's you know, 22 per group, which is much more feasible. Um, OK, so uh, next up, uh, yeah, we've got enough time. OK, uh, the paired samples t-test. This is where you have typically um, pre- and post-intervention scores. So in this example, I'm just, you know, just a generic example of uh, uh, one group that you measure before they get an intervention and then after they complete the intervention and you measure uh, their depression, maybe it's the Beck depression inventory, uh, both before and after. So for this, you go back up to test and means again, but now, see, we've got, uh, before we're looking at two independent groups. Now we're looking at two dependent groups, matched pairs. And matched pairs just means that you've got the person, uh, you know, participant one before is matched to participant one after, two and two, person three, person three, person four, person four, and so on. And so here, um, what we have is a bit of a, a more nuanced test because now you see it's effect size D, Z. And um, when you, when you have this uh, determine button, uh, it's important to note this point here, correlation between groups. 
What this means is that when you're running a within subject study like this kind of design, this pre-post design, um, somebody's score before the intervention is more likely to be correlated with their score after the intervention. So if you had a, a low score before and you had an improvement, you're going to have a higher score by, let's say, two points. Um, somebody who has a higher score is also likely to have a higher, oh, I'm sorry, right, if, if they have a higher score before, they're also going to have a higher score after, and again, it's probably going to be, let's say, three points. So for every single person, if you see an overall improvement from before to after, um, and that improvement of, is of a similar magnitude, then you're going to see this correlation, because people should react similarly to this intervention so even if somebody has a low initial score, they're going to have an improvement right, of a similar magnitude. Um, and so that's why this correlation between groups is important. Typically, you assume that it's going to be you know, a medium-sized correlation, which is what this 0.5 represents. But if you have evidence, whether from a pilot study or from previous literature or from um, you know, some other empirical source, then you can change this value. But otherwise, you can assume that that correlation is going to be 0.5. Um, and again, here you put in what you expect to happen. So again, if we're using T-scores, I guess we're expecting people to start out uh, maybe at 50 and drop down to 40, right, with a standard deviation of 10 and 10 in each group, right? So the, the mean is 50 at time one in the pre-intervention condition. The standard, <coughs> excuse me, the standard deviation is 10. After the intervention, on average, they drop by 10 points. Standard deviation is still 10, and the correlation between the, uh, the pre and post intervention scores is 0.5. So we calculate and transfer, we see our effect size pop in here, and then uh, we change the power to 0.8, calculate that, and you see that you would only need eight participants. And that's because it's a pretty big effect here. If, if I'm dropping 10 points uh, and the standard deviation is 10, that's a pretty large effect. In fact, an effect size of 1 is a extra large effect, if you want to call it that. You know, if, if we give a more realistic example, let's say it's 47, all right? It dropped by three points, or one-third of a standard deviation, um, which is similar here. Uh, now, it's obvious that we need 71. Now, notice before, it was like, okay, well, you take 71 and you split it in two, right? So you need like 35 per group. That's not the case here. Here, it's the same participants um, in both groups, right? It's, it's the pre-intervention and post-intervention are the same people. So that output is actually the total sample size, not per group. Um, I mean, it is per group, but it's, it's only one group that you're studying. Okay, um, the next one is uh, a repeated measures ANOVA, which is basically the same as a paired samples t-test, except you have more than two time points. So, you know, you could have pre-intervention, uh, one month post and three month post follow-ups to see, you know, you see a lot of these studies that show not only three but sometimes six months to demonstrate <clears throat> the, uh, the robustness of the intervention. So what you have, uh, again, you go to test and means and now we have repeated measures, uh, whoa, 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 where is it, uh, within factors ANOVA approach. So um, you click on uh, that, and then it asks you for um, the same question as the t-test, you know, what's the correlation among the repeated measures? Again, you can leave this as 0.5. Um, as a side note, uh, if you have two adjacent time points, um, they're likely to be more strongly correlated than two non-adjacent time points. So uh, the pre-intervention and one-month post-intervention are going to be more strongly correlated than the pre and three month post. And similarly, the one month post and three month post are going to be more strongly correlated than the three month and pre intervention because the pre intervention is time one and then you've got the one month in between and the three month compared to the pre is like, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be shakier. Um, but in any case, uh, the, the overall um, Correlation, unless you have evidence otherwise, you can leave it as 0.5, maybe a little less. Um, but okay, so this should be familiar by now. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but notice that you have uh, the number of groups here. And this is important because if you only have one group, so for example, if you're doing a study where you only have 
one group that's being followed over time, right? Pre-intervention, one month post, three month post. That's different than if you also had a control group. Um, so basically for this example, we only have one group, but oftentimes a design will dictate they have two groups because you want to have a control group that shows uh, what would happen if you, if you had no intervention or if you had a placebo intervention before, one month after, and three months after. Um, so that's where you would put in the number of groups. And the number of measurements, in this example we have three. And then finally you've got this non-sphericity correction epsilon. What the heck is that? Well. Um, the non-sphericity correction is where you have um, uh, this assumption of sphericity. And what sphericity means is that you have the same extent, well, the same degree of correlation between these different levels, right? So pre-intervention should be correlated the same uh, to the one month as the three month. And um, one month and three months should have the same correlation as all the other pairwise uh, correlations, which is not always the case. So um, here, uh, if if this sphericity assumption is met, if all these different groups or all these different time points at which you're measuring this group are correlated at the same, so you know all the R's are let's say 0.5, um, then you would just leave it. Uh, but um, if you don't have this assumption met, then there's a lot of different options that you have. I don't want to go into all of them because we're going to be out of time in a minute. I know there's a question about um, uh, multiple regression, which we're going to get to. Um, you, you can apply this formula here. The non sphericity correction uh, is 1 divided by the number of repetitions minus 1. So worst case scenario, um, it would be 0.5 here because we've got three repetitions, right? We've got the pre, the one month, and three months. So it would be one divided by uh, three minus one, which is two. So one over two is 0.5. And that's the worst case. Um, so what we can do is we can run it uh, and see that we need 28 participants if we're expecting a medium effect and uh, the sphericity assumption is met. If we change this to 0.5 and calculate that, you see it jumps to 44 participants. So um, somewhere in between there is where you would have to um, check your, or not check, um, where you would have to select your, your sample size. And of course this is going to vary depending on what empirical evidence you have about sphericity, but just know that that is what this um, value stands for. Okay, now let's move on to correlation and multiple regression. Correlation um, is where you just have two uh, uh, variables. Right? So maybe if you're doing uh, like a business psych study, um, you're interested in the, the correlation between um, transformational leadership and subjective employee well-being. Uh, so you can you know, correlate those two variables. And here, uh, it is the bivariate normal model. The point by serial and tetrachoric are two different things where you've got categorical variables. We're interested in um, two you know, ratio variables. And so what you're doing with a correlation is testing uh, it against no correlation. And that's what this box down here is. Uh, the, the null hypothesis is H0. The alternative hypothesis is you know, that the, the correlation is different from the null hypothesis. So typically, it's, you're testing it against 0. Um, and again, we want to know uh, with a power of 0.8. Um, and so you know, again, assuming this value of 0.3, we can calculate that and see that we need 67 participants. And again, this is the full sample size because both variables are being measured in the same participants. So 67 is the number that you would need for 0.3. Again, you can plot the range of values for the total sample size as a function of the correlation. Um, and again, if you draw this plot, you see that it's kind of, oh, well, that's too many. Let's just change this to steps of 0 .5, 0 0.05. And we see that as the correlation gets smaller and smaller, you need more and more participants to, to reliably detect it. Um, so again, it depends on what uh, you think would be a clinically significant value. I just use 0.3 as uh, the token value. It's what um, G power pops up as, as the default. But if you have any reason to believe that it's stronger or less strong, that's what you would type in here. So again, I can type in 0.1, and you're going to see that this is going to be a pretty big value. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you can also calculate this 
from the coefficient of determination, uh, which is the uh, squared correlation, but this is also um, you know, dependent on what the empirical evidence is telling you. And point three is, again, a medium effect. If we go back to that table from Cohen uh, and we look at the, the correlation, then small is 0 0.1, 0 0.3 is medium, and 0.5 is uh, large. So um, again, this is just the, the convention that's used. And uh, you know, depending on what you think you're going to get is what you would input in this field as opposed to uh, 0.3. So uh, that's correlation. Now let's move on to uh, regression. This is, uh, and I'm, I'm saying multiple regression because typically you wouldn't run a regression, uh, a bi you, can, you can run a bivariate regression, which is very, it's synonymous with a correlation actually, believe it or not. Um, but it gives you different information. But for our purposes, let's look at multiple regression. So we might be interested in the uh, degree of transformational leadership, just like before. Right? But then we also want to examine the degree of competition in the workplace and also concern for others. So this measure of sort of empathy. Right? So we want, to, we want to see whether competition and empathy and transformational leadership all predict subjective well-being, which is a bit more of a, a, a complex analysis than just looking at um, the transformational leadership correlated with subjective well-being. And there's two things that we can do here. There's, there are two forms of multiple regression that are of interest. One is the R squared deviation from zero, and the other is R squared increase. The difference between these two, and I'll just show you where these live first, uh, tests, correlation, and regression. We just saw correlation uh, up here. Now we've got multiple linear multiple regression. You see deviation from zero and increase. So uh, with deviation from zero, what this means is if you look at all three of your predictors, right, the transformational leadership, competition, and concern for others, um, if you look at all of those together, do they significantly predict subjective well-being compared to there being no effect? Um, so you're not looking at the effect of each individual variable. Now, R squared increase, this is where you can test the effect of each additional variable um, once you've already had you know, two others in there. So if you already have degree of transformational leadership, and degree of competition in a model, and then you want to say, okay, well, what additional variance can concern for others account for, and how many participants would I need to detect that effect? So, okay, starting with R squared deviation from zero, um, again, here we have the conventions that uh, G power pops up for us. Um, we've got our power value, we're going to change that to 0 0.8 again. We've got three predictors. Let's calculate that. It says, okay, 77. Now, um, there was a question before about what happens if you don't know the effect size that you're expecting. Um, now, what you can do is, again, this, this window doesn't automatically pop up, but when you click Determine here, uh, you can get a ballpark estimate of what to put for your effect size. And typically, um, you would do it from one of these two options. Uh, now, the squared multiple correlation, again, this would be based on uh, empirical data, as would this. So there's no silver bullet here. Um, but what you can do is you can say, okay, I've got three predictors, and I've, I, I can specify uh, how strong they're correlated with the outcome. So if I have previous studies that say, okay, well, I know that uh, transformational leadership is correlated at, let's say, 0.2 with subjective well-being, okay? And I know that um, the correlation between, uh, what did I say, degree of competition and uh, subjective well-being is correlated at, well, let's just say, negative 0.2. And then uh, the final one was, um, uh, what was it? Right, concern for others uh, with subjective well-being. Let's just say it's not correlated with, uh, um, with well-being. So I uh, accept these values. And then I tell it to calculate again, and you see that it, it tells me what effect size that would be. And then it transfers it over here. And of course, these are, you know, at this point, these are guesses. But depending on what literature you have, depending on what uh, evidence you have, what expectations you have, you can always, you know, specify those and get the expected effect size that um, you expect to obtain. And then you calculate that, and you see that you need 130 participants to detect uh, whether or not all three of these variables together predict um, subjective well-being. And that's the deviation from zero piece. Now, 
the other piece is the R squared increase, right? So that's the other type of test. Uh, correlation regression, and we see R squared increase. So now you see these inputs change a little bit. So um, here, what's important to note is uh, if we have a total of three predictors, but I want to know what the effect of one of them is, then I can do that here. Because the previous one is, again, just looking at all three together. So not the influence of each individual one, but all three together. Here, I can have three total, but I just want to know, okay, if I want to test the effect of one that I think has this effect size, and again, you can calculate uh, uh, the effect size here because um, the, the R squared is the amount of variance that it accounts for in the, uh, in the outcome. Um, before, we saw there was like 0.08 something, so we can just you know pop that in here. That doesn't have to be the case, but I'm just using that as a shorthand. And um, we get our effect size here, and then we know that we would need 93 participants to detect this effect size if we already have two other predictors in the model. Now, uh, it could very well be the case that one of your other two predictors has a smaller effect size that's associated with it, right? So let's say that one of them is like 0.005 or something like that. Well, we just saw, well, hold on, uh, let's just remember this value here. Um, it was 93, right, with an effect size of 0.087. Let's just say I'm going to copy that value um, and just put it into my calculator. So we know that that's the effect size for this, uh, for this one variable that we're interested in. But what if we have another variable that has a smaller effect size associated with it, right? Let's say it's 0.05. So now, it was 93 before, it's 159 now, right? So which, which do you use? Do you average them? What do you do? The answer is that you choose the one that has the higher sample size because you will see the effect size. You will see the larger effect size if you collect more data. So with a smaller effect size, we keep seeing that the smaller the effect, the more data you need. So if you have a couple of effects that are larger, you will see those um, if you collect enough data to detect a smaller effect. Okay. So uh, with that, I just have one other uh, point I want to make. And by the way, uh, does that answer your question from earlier about um, regression when you don't know the effect size? And if the answer is no, we can follow up later. You'll have my contact info. Um, OK, so uh, right, the last thing is this idea of post hoc power analysis. You'll notice that in G power, you have these different types of power analysis, one of which is post hoc that I alluded to earlier. And um, this is sort of redundant to a p-value. Uh, if you conducted your study, you know what effect size you obtained, you know a p-value you got, you know what your sample was, you know how many predictors you had, and then what this will tell you is the power that you have to detect the effect. If your value, if your p-value is 0.05, um, and you were looking for, uh, you know, this effect size, and you had this sample size, well then, you're in luck, because that's exactly the power value that you would ask for. But, you know, if you had an effect size, and you got a p-value of like 0.12, and you had a sample size of like, you know, you collected 65 data points, then, okay, your study was underpowered. Now, the p-value already tells you that it was underpowered. You didn't detect a significant effect. So, it's not that interesting. However, what is interesting is what sample size uh, you would need to obtain significant. And, of course, this is assuming that the obtained effect size is real and stable. If you collect 65, if you collect data from 65 participants, you will get some specified uh, effect size. Um, if you collect data from 1,000 participants, that effect size may look different. You have a larger sample, you have a more reliable estimate, so it might be different. But if all we have to go on is the, is the effect size that we got from our relatively small sample, um, then the question is, you know, what sample size would be required to obtain significance? So you can certainly say uh, that it's an a priori test. Now, we know that the effect size we're looking for was 0.05, right? Because that's what we got in our data, 
All right, let's say for the sake of argument, we got an effect size of 0.568. We read our SPSS output, that's the effect size. Um, what we want is a p-value of 0.05, though, right? And so now we calculate that, and it's like, okay, well, guess what? You would need 141 participants to uh, get a significant uh, finding from that. And, and so that's useful. If you're writing up a dissertation and in Chapter 5 you say, okay, well, it wasn't a statistically significant effect. Um, in order to achieve, uh, you know, a power of 0.8, I would have needed 141 participants. So future studies should expect to run this sample size. Um, and so that's a, a sort of broad overview. This article here uh, by O'Keefe um, goes into a much deeper analysis of this kind of post hoc uh, power analysis. Um, and it's uh, pretty useful. I would recommend reading it um, if you want to talk about how to, how to tackle problems of having an underpowered study. It's not always possible to get a study that has the, the appropriate power because of the real world, basically. You've got um, people who don't respond to um, surveys. Uh, you might not be able to find um, a sample that's large enough that has all the inclusion criteria met. All these different things can happen. So if that's the case, um, you know, that's a limitation. And so you always want to write that up. And uh, this kind of um, analysis can um, make it clearer how far off the mark you were. Um, so it's important to note, though, that you're still doing a priori. Remember, I said to do it in terms of the a priori power. Um, not post hoc. Post hoc means after the fact. Um, and you it's just like I showed you. You input the obtained effect size, the desired p-value, and the power that you um, want to get, and then you get the required sample size. So why not the post hoc option? This is just kind of a review of what I already said. The p-value and power are directly related. So you can include it for thoroughness, right? Like, oh, the, the power that I obtained was 0.59 or 0.25, whatever it was. Um, but the p-value already kind of tells you that. Um, okay, so with that, um, I do have time to take some questions. Um, this presentation will be available. And um, if you want to chat offline, you can email me um, or give me a call. There's my contact info there. Or if you're at the LA campus, uh, stop by room 748. Um, and with that, uh, let's see if there are any questions.